Tonight on Early Edition at 6, 159 Japanese politicians and the country's internal affairs minister Yoshitaka Shindo make a visit to the controversial Gasukuni Shrine, honoring the war dead, among them war criminals, a move likely to anger Asian victims of Japan's past aggression. This despite South Korea's repeated condemnation of the move. President Bakune offers to build a logistics network called the Silk Road Express, which would link roads and railways from Korea's southeastern port city of Busan to Europe via North Korea, Russia, and China. Seoul Conference on Cyberspace 2013 comes to a close on this Friday with the announcement of a joint declaration. The two-day gathering brought together 1,500 delegates from nearly 90 countries under the theme of global prosperity through an open and secure cyberspace. Stay with us for these stories and more. It is 5 a.m. in Washington, noon in Nairobi, and 6 on a Friday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. We begin with the president's vision for Korea and Eurasia. Right. For centuries, the Silk Road was a booming trade route that connected the East with the West. Well, today, President Park Geun-hye called for a new incarnation of the route called the Silk Road Express. The Korean leader hopes the new road will connect the Eurasian region through distribution and energy networks and ultimately boost economic cooperation and trade in the region. Our presidential office correspondent, Ah jin -ju, starts us off. President Park proposed binding the Eurasian region into a single continent. The first step towards this goal, she says, is creating a distribution network that connects northeastern Eurasia by railway and roads. Speaking at the first international conference on Eurasian cooperation in Seoul on Friday, President Park also proposed setting up an energy network through gas and oil pipelines as Eurasia is composed of both energy producing and consuming countries. She called on Eurasian countries to push ahead with joint projects to develop energy resources, such as shale gas in China and crude oil and gas in East Siberia. Creating a Eurasian economic bloc was another of President Park's proposals. Eurasia the president emphasized the importance of tearing down regulatory barriers that block trade and investment and said Korea, China and Japan should accelerate trilateral FTA talks and link up with other regional trade deals such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Experts say President Park's Eurasian plan will support her administration's key goals of boosting the economy and setting up a foundation for a peaceful reunification. Cooperation among Eurasian nations could also eventually pressure North Korea to open up. A creation of a huge economic bloc in the region would also help Korea further expand its trade and economic cooperation. Eurasia accounts for 40 percent of the world's land mass, 71 percent of the world's population, and 60 percent of the world's GDP. Oh jin -ju, Arirang News. And as the prospects for a new energy source emerges as an increasingly important issue all across the globe, scientists and experts continue their search for alternatives to fossil or nuclear energy capable of meeting the soaring energy demands. But as our Kim Yunji reports, we just may have to wait a while for a feasible substitute. This is a filtration plant in Seoul. Above the settling reservoir is a solar energy generating system. About 600,000 kilowatts of electricity is produced here annually.
That's enough to provide electricity to over 1,800 households each year and is equivalent to half the power generated by a single nuclear reactor. Although the technology is capable of generating a significant amount of energy, it has its downsides. The problem is that most renewable energy sources are still at the developmental stage. Moreover, there aren't many locations available to build power plants. There are institutional problems as well. Wind and tidal power are also problematic as the amount of energy they generate varies according to external factors and they aren't very efficient. A clean energy source that does not face such limitations is nuclear fusion energy. Highly efficient and free from radiation concerns, energy experts around the world have been working on the development of this energy source. Korea has also been taking part in the international ITER project to design and build an experimental fusion reactor along with other countries including China and France. Fusion energy is considered the alternative energy source of the future. It's clean and can supply an unlimited amount of energy. But experts say it'll take another 30 years or so before nuclear fusion energy can be commercialized. Despite investment and research into possible future energy sources, it seems we'll have to wait at least another generation for a feasible alternative to fossil fuels and nuclear power. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. And staying on the subject of energy, growing public concern about the safety of the nation's nuclear power plants has forced the government to rethink its nuclear energy policy. A recent proposal has called for half of the nation's nuclear reactors to be replaced by liquefied natural gas plants. Arirang News' Ji Myung-gil reports. This is a liquefied natural gas power plant in Korea. Natural gas is combusted to generate electricity and is perceived as one of the cleanest available source to generate power. The government had previously planned to raise the reliance on nuclear power plants to 40 percent by 2035, from just under 30 percent now. But it is now proposing to reduce the reliance to 20 percent. A revision reflects the need to lower the reliance on nuclear power plants for Korea's electricity needs, as the 40 percent reliance is unrealistic. However, running LNG power plants is expensive. To generate the same amount of power, LNG power stations is three times more costly than nuclear plants. In managing our power needs, a one percentage point energy source change from nuclear to LNG will push electricity prices up by 2 percent. That means increasing Korea's reliance on LNG power plants to 40 percent will drive up electricity fees by 40 percent. But will industries and households be able to bear the expected price hikes? Korea's core industries are steel, petrochemistry and semiconductors that use a lot of electricity. If electricity prices go up, then it would be a burden for both the industries and households. The government expects Korea's electricity consumption to double in 20 years. Even if Korea lowers its reliance on nuclear source to 20 percent of power needs, it will be inevitable for the nation to build more nuclear stations. Korea currently operates 23 nuclear reactors and is building five new nuclear power plants. Kim young Arirang News. Japan does it again. A Japanese cabinet member and a record number of lawmakers visited the controversial Yasukuni War Shrine earlier today, angering Korea and China, victims of Tokyo's wartime atrocities. Our Kim Yeonji has this story. Japan's Internal Affairs and Communications Minister Yoshitaka Shindo on Friday paid a visit to the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo on the occasion of an autumn festival there that began Thursday. Reports say that a bipartisan group of 159 Japanese lawmakers also visited the shrine Friday morning, which, according to Japan's Sankei Shimbun, is the largest number of lawmakers who visit for the festival since 1989. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, however, stayed away in an apparent gesture to mend ties with Korea and China. The two Asian nations, both victims of Japanese aggression before and during World War II, regard Yaskuni as a symbol of the country's past militarism. 
as it enshrines 14 Class A war criminals along with its war dead. The Prime Minister did, however, make an offering of a masakaki tree Thursday. Seoul's Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Thursday expressed regret and concern about Abe's offering, saying that Yasukuni glorifies Japan's past militarism. Ongoing conflicts with neighboring countries over historical matters came up when Korea's Parliamentary Committee on Education audited the nation's educational institutions on Friday. A new Korean history textbook authored by conservatives, preliminarily approved for use in high schools next year, took center stage. Critics say the textbook from Kyohak Publishing Corporation glamorizes Japan's imperial rule over Korea and the Koreans who supported it. The textbook by Kyohak says Japan's colonization of Korea contributed to the nation's modernization. What's your take on that? I oppose that theory. That's something that Korea cannot accept. I support the view that Japan suppressed and plundered Korea. The lawmakers also demanded that the heads of history and education institutions focus on countering attempts made by Japan and China to distort Korean history. They stressed that true peace in the region can only be achieved when the countries resolve their historical conflicts. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. Korea's missile defense capabilities have been a hot topic as of late, with even speculations growing that Seoul might join hands with Washington on a U.S.-led missile defense program. Well, joining us live for a more in-depth look at some of these issues at play is Arirang News' Kim Hyun-bin from our news center. Now, Kim Hyun-bin, what is the controversy at hand and uh, where does the South Korean government stand on this issue? Uh, hey, guys. Uh, the the U.S. has long argued that its allies in this region must share defense burden, while South Korea has resisted joining the U.S. missile defense system, which could undermine missile capabilities of China, Korea's largest trading partner. Earlier this week, Korea's defense minister, Kim Gwang Jin, denied speculation Seoul might join the U.S. missile program. He said it was too expensive and its huge interception range is unnecessary on the Korean peninsula. Seoul's defense ministry says Korea needs to focus on its own low-altitude system that is already under development. It's called Korea Air and Missile Defense, or KAMD. Let's take a closer look. KAMD is a multi-level missile defense system Korea is in the process of developing. The system fits Korea's terrain and the threats facing the nation. KAMD currently focuses on low-altitude missile threats, since most of North Korea's missiles targeting South Korea are not ballistic missiles and have a range of 1,000 kilometers or less. But the KAMD system has its weak points. The interceptor missile currently being used is the Patriot-2, also known as Pac-2. But this missile was originally built to take down aircraft, not missiles. The, minister, the military is currently focusing on upgrading its Pac-2s to Pac-3s, which have better accuracy and efficiency. I spoke to a weapons expert about the issue. Let's hear what he had to say. The Pac-2 explodes near the ballistic missile or target and the debris takes it down. A Pac-3 directly collides with the enemy missile, so the Pac-3 is more reliable and accurate than the Pac-2. Instead of joining the U.S. system, Defense Minister Kim said the South Korean military will enhance its KAMD program, so South Korea will be able to better counter missile threats with its own technology. On top of that, the South Korean government is scheduled to finish developing mid- and long-range surface-to-air missiles by 2022. Well, certainly sounds like a very complex issue and a decision the defense ministry did not take lightly. So Hyunbin, could you tell us a little bit more about the major differences between the missile defense systems of Seoul and Washington? Well, the U.S. missile defense system is multi-layered and is considered the best in the world. To show you what Washington's capabilities are, let's take a look at this graph. As you can see, the U.S. system works on a three-layer missile defense network. The first line of defense comes from the Aggies rocket which is designed to knock out an incoming ballistic missile while it's in space. If that fails, a theater high altitude area defense interceptor, also known as THAAD, intercepts the missile just as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. The final layer of defense is the lower altitude Patriot missile. 
Experts say the chance of a ballistic missile slipping through all three layers is very slim. Korea does not have a high altitude missile defense system, but experts say that if the Korea, Korean air and missile defense system, which is a low altitude missile defense system, is fully implemented in 2022, Korea will be able to successfully intercept missile attacks from Pyongyang. Now, Hyunbin, uh, let's put aside the cost involved in introducing this U.S. system a little bit and focus on uh, other factors that might stand in the way for the South Korean military to adopt this system. Uh, from a security standpoint, experts say it would have definitely worse South Korea's neighbors in the region, namely China and Russia. Let's hear what this expert had to say. If the U.S. system was implemented, it would restrain nuclear and missile capabilities of the countries in the region. The U.S. will be able to intercept missiles using its multi-level system. This will greatly reduce the effectiveness of the ballistic missiles, which in turn will break the strategic balance between those countries. Other experts point out, however, that at some point, whether it's with our own technology or not, Korea needs to obtain high-tech missile defense program as Pyongyang is trying to enhance his ballistic missile capabilities. All right, that was our Kim Hyun-bin reporting on South Korea's missile defense system and issues surrounding the system. Thanks, hyun -bin, for that report. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best, with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. And shipping gears to the economy, including import prices rose by... The Seoul Conference on Cyberspace 2013 comes to a close this Friday evening. Now, during the two-day event, roughly 1,500 government officials and cyberspace experts from about 90 different countries across the globe put their heads together to discuss a wide range of cyber-related issues, ranging from cybersecurity and cyberterrorism to the Internet economy. Now, as the host country, Korea is expected to introduce a joint declaration named the Seoul Framework, based on what was discussed at the conference, which will provide the international standard of guidelines for countering cyber warfare and crimes in cyberspace. Meanwhile, Korea is also hosting the International Telecommunication Union's Quadrennial Plenipotentiary Conference next year, which is dedicated to information and communication technology policy. Well, a group of Korean graduate and undergraduate students helped to get things started on Friday at a model conference in Seoul hosted by the Science Ministry. The group of 49 presented their plan for treating electronic waste or e-waste, such as mobile phones and computers. Now, the proposal will be submitted to the full conference next year for possible adoption by ITU member countries. Held once every four years, the conference is the primary policymaking arm of the ITU, a United Nations body dedicated to advocating for communication rights. Next year's event will be held in Korea's southern port city of Busan. The International Monetary Fund is predicting that developing Asian nations will again be driving the global economy in the year 2014. Romain Duval, head of the Regional Studies Division of the Asia-Pacific Department at the IMF, said in a report that the Asian economy is expected to grow by 5.3 percent next year. But he added that Asia's economic growth will slow if the United States' long-term interest rate rises after the country starts an unexpected rollback of its massive bond-buying program. Duval advised countries like Indonesia and India to implement policies aimed at preventing liquidity reductions. And we have some good news for China. The Chinese economy picked up pace in the third quarter of this year, an indicator that the nation may be back on the track of speedy growth. China's National Bureau of Statistics said Friday that the nation's economy grew 7.8 percent in the July-September period. That's up 0.3 percentage points from the previous quarter. The jump surpasses China's 2013 growth target of 7.5 percent and marks the fastest growth in nearly a year. Experts attribute the growth spurt to the government's loose monetary policy and improvements in global economic conditions.
So the U.S. government is now up and running again, and its debt ceiling has been raised just before it was going to run out of borrowing capacity. U.S. President Barack Obama, however, pointed to the damage the congressional emphasis inflicted on the world's biggest economy. Our Song ji Sun reports. Federal employees in the United States returned to work Thursday, just a matter of hours after U.S. President Barack Obama signed a congressional budget agreement into law that ended the government shutdown. Obama expressed his thanks and said that people have recognized the importance of government functions. Despite not having to make any budgetary concessions to Republicans, Obama was careful not to gloat, saying there weren't any winners. He said the, the shutdown had seriously undermined the economy and damaged the international reputation of U.S. political system. He also said Americans were completely fed up of their elected officials in Washington. There are no winners here. These last few weeks have inflicted completely unnecessary damage on our economy. Nothing has done more damage to America's credibility in the world, our standing with other countries, than the spectacle that we've seen these past several weeks. Financial services company Standard & Poor says the 16-day shutdown that closed national parks and left hundreds of thousands of federal workers at home on unpaid leave cost the economy an estimated $24 billion. Obama issued an aggressive challenge to Congress, particularly the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, telling them to stop focusing on who wins and loses political battles and to work with them on issues critical to improving the economy. He also repeated his call for Congress to take a balanced approach on a budget for the rest of the current fiscal year and pass immigration reforms proposed by the Senate. Song ji Arirang News. Well, new surveillance footage recorded during the deadly attack on a shopping mall in Nairobi last month has emerged, and it provides a chilling glimpse of the ruthless terrorists who brutally murdered so many innocent people. Well, the footage obtained by CNN shows terrified shoppers running for their lives during the September 21st attack on the Westgate Mall. The resulting siege lasted four days, and by the time it was over, at least 67 people had died, including a South Korean woman. In one clip, the attackers are seen in a stock room, taking turns to kneel and pray while other gunmen walk through a supermarket, nonchalantly talking on their phones. The Al-Qaeda-linked Somali militant group Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for that attack, saying it was retribution for Kenyan involvement in Somalia. Well, if you're planning on being out and about in Seoul, Korea on Saturday afternoon, brace yourself for heavier than normal traffic. Two large-scale rallies are scheduled in the heart of downtown. One will be staged by about 5,000 members of the Korean Teacher and Education Workers Union. They will gather at 2 p.m. at Sodemun and march to Seoul Plaza. The other, scheduled for the same afternoon, will be led by about 700 members from a committee within the Unified Progressive Party who will walk from Seoul Plaza and pass by Sungnemun before looping back around. Authorities recommend using public transportation and avoiding the protest area if possible. Time for weather with our Kim Bo Gyeong. Hello there, Bo Gyeong. It seems like it's getting a little bit warmer this afternoon compared to the past days. You would be right because temperatures did rise to average autumn levels today afternoon, and it looks like it's going to stay that way for a while. And Bo Gyeong, you know, this weekend might be a really good chance then for people to uh, head to Mount Seorak or even Mount Ode to uh, check out the beautiful fall foliage. That's right, Kon Young. But light showers are forecast in Gangwon Province tomorrow late at night, so you should avoid hiking after the sun goes down. Now, today we got off to a pretty chilly start in, here in Korea before temperatures rose to the low 20s in the afternoon. Tomorrow morning, temperatures around the country will be a couple of degrees higher than today, 
but the big temperature gaps will persist, so make sure to bundle up before you head out in the morning. Now, taking a closer look at tomorrow's forecast, Seoul makes it to 22 degrees. Meanwhile, cities down south should have a cloudy day, reaching the low 20s. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju should also make it to the low 20s. Meanwhile, Dokdo and Mount Kumgang should peak at 18 and 9 degrees, respectively. Hope you have a wonderful Friday evening, and I'll be back with more updates after 8. Thank you for that, Po Gyeong. And that's a wrap for us for this week. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gon Young. Thank you, as always, for being here with us. Hope you find the time to catch the leaves in their colorful splendor and the crisp fall air this weekend. And we'll see you right back here, same time, Monday evening. Good night.